let's talk a little bit about ovarian cancer. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, maybe just give folks a little bit of a anatomy of the female reproductive system so that what's an ovary, what are the, what are the little tubes that connect it to the uterus? You know, give, give folks a sense of what that anatomy is. Ah, yeah. So this is an incredible um, area where we're doing some work. You know, our research team at Johns Hopkins is dedicated to studying the big issues in healthcare that we are not talking about, that we should be talking about. Where research is taking off, new science is pointing to things that like, hey, pay attention. And there's not a lot of attention or NIH dollars. And one of those areas is the true origin of ovarian cancer. The ovary... Uh, sits draped under the fallopian tube. And the end of the fallopian tube has uh, finger-like projections called the fimbriae. So we're talking like a millimeter. I mean, they're almost really in contact. And so um, you want me to explain how this yeah, looks? Yeah, yeah. So it turns out we- What is an ovary, first of all? Like, what does it make? Why do women have them? You know, where do the eggs go? All that kind of stuff. So it used to be thought that the only purpose of the ovary is to produce sex hormones, but it's not true. It produces, um, you know, as we you've talked about with estrogen is involved in heart health and so many things, um, but it produces the eggs that then um, are go down a little circulation through the fallopian tube into the uterus. And um, doctors have really struggled with ovarian cancer really no major progress in modern medicine. You get most of the cases are lethal or present in late stages. There's almost nothing you can do. Very little surgical intervention. There are some cases where it's early enough, but overall the fatality rate is over 50%. And there's a strong association between certain types of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. Yeah, there is um, with the uh, hereditary predisposition so some people get tested, but a big study was just done in the UK looking at screening tests for ovarian cancer. Should we have mass population screening like we do? Using for, what? Ultrasound? Using ultrasound, and they've done CAT scans, and none were show, shown to improve the outcomes in people uh, and detecting ovarian cancer. None. Total failure. They abandoned the entire idea of ovarian cancer screening based on this big UK study. So here we are with a cancer with almost no advances, a ton of money. It's not for lack of funding at the NCI. And what is going wrong here? Well, I love this sort of blind spot of medicine because it shows how when you're certain of something in medicine, you can still benefit from challenging deeply held assumptions. It turns out that there was a recent discovery that ovarian cancer does not come from the ovary, the most common and lethal type comes from the fallopian tube and the cells float onto the ovary. It, so we have taken out millions of healthy ovaries to prevent ovarian cancer, you know, during abdominal surgery, during a hysterectomy, the ovaries will be removed to so-called prevent ovarian cancer. Turns out we were targeting the wrong organ. And so with this new discovery that biologically, based on the genetics, based on um, a lot of good research that's emerged from Penn, Dr. Drapkin, uh, a guy at Johns Hopkins, one of my colleagues, there's a gynecologic oncologist now, this is her entire career focus, is that we have to increase public awareness that this is really not ovarian cancer the vast majority of the time, it's fallopian tube cancer, and we can prevent it because the fallopian tube serves no function after one, a woman's childbearing years. It's not like... Right. Even after menopause, there's very low levels of estrogen that can trickle out of the ovary for a while. But after a woman's done having kids, if they come in and say, I want my tubes tied, the new answer at Johns Hopkins is- Take them out. We don't do that anymore. We remove the fallopian tubes to massively reduce your one in 78 chance of developing ovarian cancer it's that in the high? future. Yeah, it's that high. One in 78? Yeah, I love it that you have that reaction because I had the same reaction. I realized we don't think like that in clinical medicine. Like at the Pancreas Cancer Conference once I asked, what it, this patient was asking, what is her lifetime chance of developing pancreatic cancer? And I said, well, you have no risk factors. And she goes, well, what is it? And I'm like, you mean just for an everyday person? And I asked the experts. No one knew. I looked it up. It's See, one I would have guessed one in... 
I was going to guess one in 20, actually, but maybe it's less than that. That's, that's for all pancreatic cancers. You mean pancreatic adeno lethal cancer? Yes. One in 67 is what oh, we found. That? Okay. I would have guessed even more frequent, truthfully. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I think the fourth most common lethal GI cancer or yeah. something like that. Fifth most common lethal cancer, full stop, not GI, right? So Cause of death? Or cause of death. Okay. Yeah, cause of death, right? It goes, number one is lung. Mm -hmm. Number two, breast and col uh, breast and prostate, and then colon, and then pancreas. And breast is only over um, pancreas because it's almost all in almost exclusively women, whereas pancreas is men and women. But it's about forty thousand for both breast and pancreas cancer. Anyway, it's kind of, you know we think about well, if you have, and this is what the docs told me in the conference. Well, if she has chronic pancreatitis, her her relative risk is increased twenty eight percent. Okay, well, that's not what she's asking. She's asking, what, what are the chances? But again, Marty, I'm still surprised that ovarian is as high as 1 in 78 and yeah. pancreas is 1 in 67. Um, so Most common GI, GYN cause of death. Most yeah, I, I, I believe that for sure. Um, okay, so how widely accepted is it today that ovarian cancer is a misnomer? Like, is that what you're basically saying? Yeah. It's not ovarian cancer, it's fallopian tube cancer? Yeah. Now, you, for the vast majority of these cancers, you can have other types of gonadal tumors that are much more benign that arise out of the ovaries. There's many types of cancers in that little region. But the most common, the, the rank and file, what we call ovarian cancer, does not come from the ovary. It comes from the fallopian tube. And this is what we previously thought of as serous ovarian cancers. Serous adenosis carcinoma, yeah. Is a fallopian tube it's, cancer. It's a fallopian tube cancer. Well, how is that not understood? How is the histology of, I mean, I just don't, do the cells look the same? Because, I mean, pathologists for decades have examined this because when a woman gets ovarian cancer, she doesn't die from the ovary. She dies from where it spreads to, right? That's She's right. dying from the spread of that cancer to another part of her body. So when they take those cells and they're looking at them under a microscope and they're staining them, why, why did it take so long to figure this out? Because of medical group think. And when I interviewed the scientists that were involved in this discovery, the resistance that they encountered was the same old story of the people who challenged the low-fat diet and opioids are not addictive and HRT and all this other stuff. It's, just, it's the same story. They, um, at UCSD, San Diego, a pathologist there wrote a very bold essay in one of the medical journals where he said, I'm telling you the cells we're looking at do not look like ovarian cancers. These ovarian cancer cells, they don't look like ovarian cells. And he got, of course, you know, piled attacked on. and piled on like the H. pylori is caused by, you know, causes ulcer guy. He just got destroyed. And his courageous step actually led some researchers to say, and then I think it was the Netherlands, to say, actually, we're going to explore this a little bit. And they did a little bit more of an analysis it was like 15 years ago. And they they kind of affirmed him a little bit. They were like, yeah, we are seeing the same thing. They did a series of, of um, people who had um, BRCA mutations. And then uh, this guy, Ronnie Drapkin and um, Chris, I can't remember his last name, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, they decided, and it was incredible, that Chris had a mentor at Brigham and Women's, and he goes... When everyone's laughing an idea at an idea in science, that's a signal you should look into it. That you should, your curiosity should kick in. But let's be clear, and I want to keep coming in back to this. Maybe 19 out of the 20 things that we laugh at, we should be laughing at. Yes. I mean, this is the thing I just want to make sure we're not giving people a license to assume that every dumb idea is right. Yeah, because most dumb ideas end up being dumb and wrong. Yeah, we don't want to promote snake oil here on, yep. the, on the drive, but we do want to, um, but it is an, an interesting. Yes, how, but, but uh, so, so yeah. it's, this is the challenge, right? Is the signal this to is... noise ratio is still incredibly low. And the, the examples that are most remarkable always looked a little foolish at the outset. But I think what we want to do is just make sure that people understand that just having a crazy idea is not sufficient. That's right. You have to have a means of... It, it, you know, stating what a hypothesis is, 
determining how to test that hypothesis and above all else having the ability to update your hypothesis based on new emerging information and um because again most yeah. crazy ideas end up being wrong that's right just f full stop wrong yeah um, most ideas end up being wrong yes so <laughs> so yeah it, it it's it's very challenging um wh where are we right now in in terms of like rolling this insight out into broader oncologic care. So you said at Hopkins, if a woman wants to get a tubal ligation, uh, tying of the fallopian tubes, she is told, we'll happily take your fallopian tubes out, but if we're gonna go in there, we might as well make sure you never get cancer. Um, Massively reduce the risk, yeah. Yeah, where, where, um, where else do we see this? How ubiquitous is the acceptance of this? Um, and is there any uncertainty that remains here? Or is this basically now a fait accompli as far as our understanding of that physiology? There is uncertainty because I think as early as we are in something like this, there always will be. But it is now standard of care in Germany and most of Canada that when a woman comes in for any abdominal surgery, elective abdominal surgery. So and even a lap cholecystectomy, if you're taking your gallbladder out. Yes, even a lap coli, most commonly a lap coli, actually. Woman comes in because that's more common in women and they're finished having children. They will be offered to remove the fallopian tubes, sparing the ovaries as during the procedure as a concomitant surgery. Okay, and the general surgeon does this. So the general surgery, and I, I'm doing this now in my practice, a woman comes in, done having kids, uh, Rebecca Stone, who is our GYN oncologist, who's one of the national she leaders. She comes in and does the salping. Yeah, yep. I don't okay. want to be taking out the yeah. round ligament and, or something. Yeah, and tell me, um, what is the probability um, of taking out the fallopian tube and damaging an ovary such that a woman ultimately needs an oophorectomy as well, which would be a disaster, an absolute disaster for a woman to lose her ovaries if she's premenopausal and still relying on those for hormones. Yeah, and I think you've touched on a big unknown there, which is the single reason why this is not a broad recommendation for any woman in everyday person to come in for just their fallopian tube removal. It is only offered as a concomitant procedure. The OBs are very good at this. They say it's a simple procedure. But here's the issue if you make a broad recommendation for every woman who's done having kids to come in and have this done. What if one in 20 surgeons is going to have a complication rate of 5%? You've canceled out all the public health benefit of reducing ovarian cancer. So that's why um, it's, for now, the recommendation, and this is a recommendation that not even all of our surgeons at Hopkins are aware of, is that when we're in there doing another elective abdominal procedure in a woman who's finished having children, and generally on the younger side, not over 67, I think, is the average age for ovarian cancer. So after that, you're benefit diminishes. So in that window of done having kids before they're in their mid 60s or so, and this is, we're just using our best judgment here. Um, that's the group where we're offering now that, hey, I can have you talk with our OBGYN doctors. They can come in and redu reduce your one in 78 chance of her. In Canada, they've done giant studies now, and they're showing actually lower rates of ovarian cancer long term. Hmm. And so we're waiting for some of that data to come out. But it's, it's pretty wild. And it, the pathologist, Dr. Valikus at Johns Hopkins, has actually said, Marty, we haven't made progress with chemotherapy on ovarian cancer. Right. And maybe this is why. We may have been targeting the wrong type of organ tissue. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, and it's an opportunity. It's also an opportunity for people to be, be aware of this best practice out there. But, you know, like the guy who needs to see three randomized controlled trials to do the non-operative protocol for appendicitis, it's going to take time. I mean, only uh, some doctors in the United States outside of GYN are doing this. The American Academy of OBGYN has actually put out a statement recommending women who come in after mm. they're done having kids. So there's actually a national guideline on it, but it takes a long time for people to understand, become aware, learn the best practice. I hope it can address the uh, ovarian cancer incidents. And if, you know, it's in my mind, it's in the bucket of challenging certainty. If you're 100% certain that 
this cancer must come from the ovary, be open-minded to the fact that, hey, there's some things here that we haven't understood in the past. For example, tubal ligation has resulted in a lower risk of ovarian cancer. Hmm, interesting. Maybe it's blocking off some of the cells that could have caused cancer and migrated down. Maybe it's killed off some of the lining. Yep. Um, there was there's an understanding that ovarian cancer is more likely to spread, more likely to be discovered after it's spread. Well, there's a little gap between the fallopian tube and the ovary, so maybe it disseminates in early stages because of that gap. So there's some interesting things that are now fitting together. 